Let's start. Um, uh, welcome to the Stride webinar uh, on the iStreet program, implementing solutions from transportation research and evaluation of emerging technologies. I am Prithvi Manjanatha. I am the iStreet test, uh, test bed manager here at the University of Florida Transportation Institute. Uh, today, before we start our presentation, we would like to know who you are as an audience. Um, so we have a couple of uh, poll questions for you. Let me put, pull them up. Yeah, I'm going to launch the poll. We want to know um, answer to two questions. Um, we had a similar webinar last year uh, for under the Stride webinar series. We want to know if, if you uh, attended that webinar or you uh, watched it later on YouTube. Uh, secondly, we want to know how familiar you are with the iStreet program. We will give it about a minute for everyone to answer. Okay, we are uh, getting some results now. Um, I'll close the poll in about 10 seconds. Okay, so only one of you attended uh, last year's um, Stride webinar. So a lot of you are watching this webinar series on iStreet for the first time. So um, yeah, that's good. You will learn a lot of information about iStreet today. And uh, again, only one of you is very familiar and uh, it and the, the split is 54-52 uh, between somewhat familiar to not familiar at all. So uh, whether you are somewhat familiar or not familiar, you have come to the right place. So we, we will try to uh, uh, introduce iStreet program in the beginning and then we will uh, delve into what are the latest update and the projects we have been doing under the iStreet program. So um, yeah, that way um, both both sets of people can can get information out of this webinar. Okay. Um, Coming to the introduction of the uh, um, uh, today's webinar, so the introduction will be done by Dr. Lily uh, Elefteridu. She is the director of the UF Transportation Institute. We were also supposed to get um, Melissa McCready, uh, the director of transportation and mobility at the city of Gainesville. She, unfortunately, she couldn't be here, uh, but Dr. Lily has a statement from her uh, uh, to share. Uh, I'll follow that up with a number of infrastructure projects that we are doing. Um, along with, uh, and then we'll talk about uh, autonomous shuttles that we have in Gainesville as well as in Lake Nona. And Dr. Jane we will we'll talk about a project that she's doing on school zone and bicyclists, followed by Dr. Agarwal, Dr. Banerjee, Dr. Mason. Uh, as you can see, um, we have a lot of speakers on this presentation. Typically on in Stride webinars, we have only two or three speakers. Uh, but today's, uh, today our intention is to give you a broad overview, uh, a big picture of what iStreet program is. And, and each of these uh, presentation can, can, do a, can be a webinar on their own. Uh, the idea is to give a big picture so that, you know, whatever interests you, you can follow it up later on. Uh, it also kind of shows the breadth and depth of the program. Uh, with that, I will uh, uh, give the time to Dr. Lily to introduce the iStreet program. Hello everyone uh, and, and welcome. Um, before I talk about iStreet, just a couple of words on, uh, on Stride, uh, which is our uh, regional university transportation center headquartered at the University of Florida. Um, and the screen there shows uh, our partner uh, university, uh, universities across the Southeast. Um, so as part of, uh, of Stride, um, we have, um, um, we have been, uh, we've started the iStreet uh, testbed also in collaboration with uh, the Florida Department of Transportation and the city of Gainesville. Uh, for Stride, we also have a, a series of, um, of webinars. Um, so if you haven't uh, registered for those, I encourage you to, to do so. Um, those are usually on uh, Wednesdays uh, around lunchtime. Um, so, um, I straight a couple of words on that. Uh, it started uh, back in uh, 2017 with a um, 
strategic plan that was funded by FDOT. It is a collaboration between the University of Florida, FDOT, and, uh, and the city of Gainesville. And uh, the projects that you will hear about today um, started either conceptually um, back when, uh, when we first uh, had the idea for, uh, for the I Street uh, test bed. Uh, it's been a it's been a great experience, and um, I encourage you to uh, learn more about each of the projects um, that you're going to get a, an overview uh, about. Um, as uh, as Proofy said, um, Melissa McCready is the director of mobility for the city of Gainesville, and uh, one of our partners. And um, she was going to give a, a welcome here today, but unfortunately, she had to. Um, uh, pulled away um, just 10 minutes ago. So she asked me to say that um, the city of Gainesville enjoys the partnership with the University of Florida and, uh, and FDOT and that um, the ability that we have to support and test uh, emerging technologies with city infrastructure um, is, uh, is unique. Um, the, the city now has support from FDOT with a new section that's been added to the traffic operations team with engineers that are dedicated to manage the, the city's infrastructure and systems for, uh, for ITS and autonomous connected vehicles. And, uh, and the city is looking forward to continuing to explore new opportunities um, with the I Street partnership. Um, hopefully Melissa will be able to join a little bit later. Um, but uh, I'm very thankful for uh, uh, for the city's partnership and uh, and Melissa's initiative and and leadership. So with that, uh, let me uh, turn it over to to Prufi for uh, for the rest of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lily. Um, so before we start on the I Street infrastructure projects, I want to pull back a little bit, step back, and you know take a look at the big picture. So this is the these are all the projects under the Florida Connected Vehicle Initiative. So um, as you can see, there's a lot of concentration of the projects in the, in and around the Gainesville area. Those are all pretty much a part of the I Street program. Uh, I'll link. I'll leave a link to the. Uh, FDOT website where you have the information of all these projects in the chat box later. And now zooming in um, to the I Street program. So this is the I Street, uh, the, uh, a map of I, I Street infrastructure projects or the instrumentation. So as you can see, uh, the purple and the red line show the uh, arterials and the uh, freeway parts of um, I-75 frame projects. Close to 100 plus um, roadside units have been in, installed in, in under this project along with the Gainesville Trapezium, which is in green around the UF campus. Um, if you don't know UF campus, so that's where our football field is. That's the UF campus. So the green Trapezium around is our uh, Trapezium project. Along with that, we have a, a pedestrian and bicyclist pilots in the small square in the uh, near the same picture. And we also have the Gainesville Autonomous Shuttle. So I'm going to talk briefly about each of these projects before uh, turning it over to Jesus about the shuttle. Uh, first, the Gainesville Trapezium. So uh, under this project, uh, RSUs have been installed already at 27 different traffic signals around the university. So the four arterials that you're looking at on your screen right now, they basically uh, are the boundaries of the, the main UF campus. Um, so close to 60 onboard units have been uh, um, installed on UF and the city fleet. So uh, we are in the process of finalizing those installations. So uh, it started as a, a signal phasing and timing or a SPAT project, but with the value addition, now it has become a much bigger project. Uh, and there are about 16 different connected vehicle based applications that are coming out of this project. And DOT recently held a number of workshops uh, for its staff and uh, it, it you know, it, 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 it has been very successful so far. Uh, from the UF side, we are doing the evaluation of this project. We want to do the before and after evaluation. Dr. Sanjay Ranka from the computer science is taking the lead on that evaluation component. Uh, the next project is um, Gainesville Pedestrian and Bicyclist uh, Connected Vehicle Pilot. So these are the four roads. Uh, on the on and on the edges of the campus that that has a lot of pedestrian and bicyclist and even scooter traffic um, so uh, so what uh, dot plans to do is to uh, instrument this uh, these corridors with uh, 
the pedestrian, both active and passive pedestrian detection and warning systems. Uh, just like the previous uh, Gains Field Trapezium project, we will be doing a before and after evaluation uh, of, of this uh, connected vehicle pilot. So when we do an evaluation, we are looking at basically safety and mobility components, you know, how, you know, what kind of impact it has. So, um, and after this, we have a uh, autonomous shuttle in Gainesville. We also have an, a, another autonomous shuttle. First, uh, I would like to uh, let Jesus uh, talk about the Gainesville autonomous shuttle, and, and then I'll expand on, on that. Uh, Jesus, do you want to share your screen? Can you see it? Not yet. Not yet. What about now? Uh, we don't see anything yet. Hmm. Okay, we are seeing something now. Okay, we're good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you see the whole screen? Yep. Okay, uh, well, um, I'm seeing that not many people are familiar with these, with some of these projects, but that's, this project was... Uh, course one of the I Street initiatives um, in partnership with DOT and, and the city and and of course the university um, being 100% funded by DOT the, the main intent was to have a charter between EUF and downtown operating under regular conditions and, and trying to test the vehicle technology as a part of the research um, testing the application and make recommendation for any for a transit application this project believe it or not started in 2017 within <laughs> it's supposed to it was supposed to be a three-year project but it's been on and off because of the NHTSA is been stopping the the you know the 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 vendor needs to apply for waivers to to pro you know to operate and it's been on and off. It's probably being as slow as the vehicle itself. <laughs> um, the, with the vendor is uh, trans transdeb services and and the type of vehicles is an easy mile. We the we're on, on phase one of this uh, project and it's currently running only one vehicle, uh, 10, 20 minute frequency. Hopefully next week we start uh, uh, having a 10 minute frequency with two vehicles. Um, basically it's on, on, on that phase one route from the city parking garage to um, the infinity hall in that area. Um, phase two um, is part of the, we're gonna be installing connected vehicle uh, onboard units so we can do B2I connection on 13th Street. Hopefully, we submitting that application to NHTSA soon so we can go to phase two. And it's basically going across street to, to serve EUF. Phase three and the final route is uh, extending that route to the city's uh, depot park and going all the way to, to UF. Um, right now, um, of course, uh, the goals are to see the, to data, to get data collection for, for research. It's been already on a couple of our researches that you probably um, talk later on. But one of the, well, of course, the data sharing, that's we working on that, trying to get that information. Workforce training for the future, pedestrian bike detection, you know, how is compared to other uh, fixed route services and develop recommendations for new regulations in the future. Um, right now, the we're only on phase one that is supposed to be for six months, but it's been, it's been going on for quite a while now. 
and hopefully we we switch to phase two in the near future. The last phase on on this is that the 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 goal is to be on demand and without a, a, a operator on the vehicle. Right now we have only the capacity is reduced to four passengers, you know, because the, the social distance and the COVID is affecting the service. And um, well, hopefully we, we can have enough information to share in the, in the near future. I know that that's been an ongoing issue with the vendor trying to get the data collection in place. With that, uh, um, that's all I have. Okay, all right. Thank you so much, Jesus. Um, I'll, I'll come back to the presentation now. So uh, Jesus mentioned uh, the shuttle started operating again now. Um, so when, um, before the shuttle started operating, so we were commissioned by UF to do a study on uh, how the perception of uh, public changes before and after the uh, autonomous shuttle is introduced. So we are yet to do the after study, but I have some uh, results from the before survey that, that we did a couple of years ago. Um, we surveyed around 600 people uh, in Gainesville. Uh, Gainesville is a college town. The results are going to be skewed because it's all young population. Uh, so, but we did find that, you know, 77% of the surveyed uh, said that they would use auto autonomous shuttle uh, at that time it was called autobus on their typical commute uh, the degree to which they agree kind of changes between somewhat to moderate to strongly agree uh, and then when we looked at how people respond for, uh, as riders in the shuttle versus drivers and pedestrians interacting with the shuttle we found slightly different results uh, um, so as drivers uh, they feel more confident interacting with the shuttle. Although some of them, they did say that they would avoid driving along the autonomous shuttle or they would avoid driving in front of it. They still seem to be confident. Whereas when it came to pedestrians and bicyclists, they were much more concerned about, you know, how to interact with the autonomous shuttle. Because if it's the human driver, you know, then they can make an eye contact and they know whether to cross or not and how, you know, how to deal with it. So. Uh, the initial reaction is overall positive towards the autonomous shuttles, uh, uh, moderately okay as drivers. There are some concerns as pedestrians and bicyclists. So we plan to do the after survey soon now that the shuttle uh, is back in service. So it will be interesting to see how this uh, uh, opinions change uh, over time with the interaction with the shuttle. Uh, talking about autonomous shuttle, we are also working on another project uh, on another autonomous shuttle. Uh, this is uh, from a company called Beep at Lake Nona. Lake Nona is a small town near Orlando. Uh, there are two uh, uh, main shuttle uh, companies uh, right now. The, the Gainesville one is the Easy Mile shuttle, whereas the, the one at Lake Nona is the Navia shuttle. Um, so. The service launched last year and they had to halt it due to COVID shutdowns in March, but they are now back uh, again since June. Uh, we, uh, we got uh, funded from uh, DOT uh, to do this project. The main aim of this project is to look at the vehicle uh, behavior, uh, you know, when it, when it is interacting with the surrounding traffic in different situations and to see whether we can associate specific behavior to specific design characteristics and also monitor, monitor uh, interactions and study behavior through videos. So we'll use two sets of data. One is the in-vehicle video and the other one is the vehicle engagement status, whether it's driving on an auto mode or a manual mode and, you know, and what is the, the acceleration and speed status of the vehicle. Using that, we want to understand how the shuttle interacts with uh, different traffic elements, including pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, those are uh, some of the uh, some of our work with the autonomous shuttles. Uh, a quick note on the questions. So if you are if you have any questions, we do have a Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. Please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box anytime. Uh, with that, I would move on to the next project. Uh, this is from Dr. Jane at the Computer Science uh, uh, department. So uh, I'll uh, give it over to her to explain our project. Dr. Jane. 
Thank you, Prithvi. I'll just share my screen. Is my screen visible? Yep. All right. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ekta Jain. I'm an assistant professor in computer science. And this is a collaborative project that was done uh, with myself and Dr. Siva Srinivasan, who's uh, associate professor in civil engineering and member of the UFTI. Uh, our other collaborator on this project was uh, Clark Letter, who was uh, formerly at UFTI and then um, uh, left, but was very integral in the initial setting up phase of this project. So our project objectives were to evaluate the efficacy of an app that performs two kinds of alerting uh, functionalities. The first is it will alert a driver if they are speeding in a school zone. And the second is that it will alert a driver if they are nearing a bicyclist. This is an app that runs on your phone and it's a commercially available app, though it's not been deployed in Florida. So all the tests that we did in Florida were special tests where um, certain beacons were activated for the purpose of doing this study. So our driving circuit included a few different school zones, um, some, some being elementary and one middle school as well. This entire driving circuit started at the UF East campus at the T2 center. We used the parking lot over there to consent our participants, have them do a practice run just so that they got you know, acclimated to the vehicle. And then we had them drive first on the yellow segment and then on the orange and red and so on. So they drove counterclockwise through this, uh, sorry, clockwise through this circuit. What you'll see marked over here are also positions where we staged a bicyclist. And that's where we had one of our experimental staff pose as a bicyclist. bicyclist. So we knew that the bicyclist was in the same place every time for each participant. We used the UFTI instrumented vehicle for this um, study. And we used a smartphone which was running the um, Travel Safely app. And we did this so that we were not um, asking participants to download the app onto their own personal cell phones. You know, they may have had concerns with respect to how much data would it use and so on. And importantly, we could not uh, control what their smart, whether they had a smartphone or what their phone was, you know, what the model was going to be and whether it was going to be compatible with um, what the app needed in terms of the specs. And so we just used the UFTI smartphone and gave it to each participant for the duration of the study. Another aspect of the study was to combine driver, uh, you know, driver behavior in terms of the trajectory of the vehicle with driver behavior in terms of how they paid attention to the road inside the, from inside the vehicle. And in order to do this, we had our participants wear eye tracking glasses while they did this drive. And I'll show you in a little bit uh, what eye tracking um, is and what kind of data it enables us to get. So the study consisted of drivers going through uh, participant drive, participating drivers being put in one of three conditions. The first condition was stealth mode. And what this means is that we had the phone and it had Travel Safely app running, but the participants were not told that. So it was just put on the side and phone audio was muted and the drivers were just asked to drive down the driving circuit. And this gave us a baseline, right? So we were able to collect data on how many alerts were triggered, how, what, how many speeding instances were there without the drivers getting any alerts. The second condition was the audio on condition. And what this means is 
that the phone audio was placed at maximum volume and the phone was placed in the center console. And what that allowed us to do was that it allowed us to provide drivers with an audio only alert, which means that they did not necessarily look at the phone when they received an alert. The third condition was audio visual on. And what this refers to is when you see the um, picture, that's if you're able to see my mouse, the picture, which is the bottom picture over there, we mounted the cell phone to the left of the steering wheel, kind of like how you might mount your cell phone when uh, you're following directions, right? Like or you're, you're doing Uber or something like that. Um, and what this allows us to do is to uh, is allows us to look for what happens when drivers get the audio alert as well as a visual alert. So the Travel Safely app provides two kinds of alerts and we divided the participants between the two kinds of alerts. The circles that you see in these pictures are telling us where the drivers were paying attention. So that is the focus of their attention at this moment in time. What's um, worth pointing out over here is that um, the way visual perception works is that we do not see every portion of the visual scene around us in equally high resolution. So our eyes are designed so that we have very high acuity in a very small region, which is around where the eyes are pointed. So it's a two to five degrees visual angle around the optical axis. And then our visual acuity rapidly falls. So we're still able to see, but not in high resolution. So these circles represent the places where humans are focusing. So these are the places that they are looking at, and they can see this in high detail. In the peripheral regions, our visual perception system is able to detect motion, for example, right? Uh, this is, you can imagine, uh, uh, the, the evolutionary kind of um, reasoning for this, we need to be able to detect that a lion is coming from the side, right? But we need to be able to look ahead in very high resolution to be able to aim that spear at the deer far away. So here's what we find when we look at the data that we get out of this study. The first thing that we looked at was were people looking at the flashing school zone beacons? And that's our kind of our proxy for, are they alert in a school zone? So what you'll see over here is that even in the off mode, participants were looking at the school zones. So if you were to look at them, you know, averaged over all the school zones, about 60, 60 more than 60% of the participants looked at the flashing school zone beacon. And that tells us that this infrastructure is, is working, right? For the most part. What you'll notice over here is an anomaly, which is school zone three. And that's where the flashing school zone beacon was not a roadside beacon, it was an overhead beacon. And that placement of the beacon probably combined with the fact that the approach speed was also quite high for that school zone, probably accounts for why many drivers missed that beacon. So what an eye tracking technology or these eye tracking glasses allowed us to do was to collect um, behavioral data on what the drivers attended while they were driving. This is something that's very hard for drivers to self-report, right? But did I see the school zone beacon? Maybe I did, yeah, I think I did, right? It's very hard for, it's human to not be able to accurately report that. But through this sensing system, we're able to get data on it. What you'll also see over here is that for the audio on and audio visual on conditions, people are looking at the school zone beacons a little bit more in the audio visual on conditions compared to the audio on condition. So now what I'm going to do over here is to play out this video clip for you all. The purple uh, 
circle over there marks what the drivers are focusing on. So we'll start the clip when the drivers are focused in the distance, as you might imagine. And you'll hear the driver, uh, you'll hear the alert, the, the alert occur. And you'll also notice that the driver's pay, uh, this driver looks at the flashing school zone beacon. And the graph that you'll see on the right is the speed of the vehicle in this segment. There, beacon, dashboard, checking the speed. And if I may point out the graph on the right, once the driver enters the school zone, they are starting to decelerate in this case. And then when the app is triggered, they probably decelerate a little bit more. So we looked at the, uh, the speed that was computed from the driving trajectory as well. And what we could see over here is that it looked like there was a lower likelihood of speeding when the app was in, when the app was on, either the audio condition or the AV audio visual condition. So what you see over here is this likelihood broken down by school zone. So what you'll see is that when the audio visual condition is on, then there are fewer instances of speeding. And here it is where we are looking at just the raw numbers, not as percentages. Right? So there were quite a few total instances of speeding, both for stealth and audio on, and fewer total instances of speeding when the audio visual um, condition was there. And if we were to look at the percentage of times the app triggered, which means these are the number of instances where people exceeded the speed limit plus the threshold that the app set, uh, that uh, the app had preset for triggering an alert, this reduces in the audio on and audio visual on condition. Uh, Dr. Jain, you have about a minute. Ah, fantastic. Um, so some of the things that we learned, this was the first field study that was done as part of the I Street Testament, a naturalistic driving study. And some of the things that we learned was that um, the app was quite uh, sensitive to the, um, the way the geofences were set up. And we had to work a little bit with the vendors on correcting that as part of our pilot tests. Moving on to the second portion of the, the second aim of the study, which was, did, did the app work in terms of making the drivers safer around bicyclists. What we found was that the probability of looking at a bicyclist, in other words, being aware of a bicyclist, increased when the app was uh, on, highest for audio on condition, and a little bit less for audio visual on condition, which is likely because um, people tended to look at the phone, right, possibly. So to summarize, there were fewer instances of instantaneous speeds exceeding the speed limit in the app on conditions compared to stealth mode, which means app off. There were fewer instances of the app triggering in the app on condition. Drivers more, more likely to notice the cyclist in the app on. And we suspect that the audio visual condition, which means when the app shows you an alert in the form of a red triangle that's flashing, it might draw attention away from the cyclist towards the phone. And that issue does not occur when the, there are audio alerts only. The caveat here, of course, is that we have very small sample sizes. All the results are based on 50 subjects that were distributed over three conditions. So we want to uh, just mention that uh, when we talk about the conclusions and how generalizable they are. 
thank you. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take those. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Jane. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please uh, type them in at the uh, chat box. We'll uh, come back to you at the end of the presentation. Uh, one thing I did forget to mention is that Dr. Jane also leads uh, the Human Factors Group here at the UF Transportation Institute. Um, I will uh, put the link to our uh, Human Factors Group in the chat box. You can take a look at it on your own time. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jane. Uh, so next in oh, on the uh, on the topic of transit components would be Dr. Nitin Agarwal. He is the director of the, our technology transfer uh, program. Uh, he also dons several other hats. Um, I'll, I'll let him take over now. All right, thank you, Prithvi. Can you see my screen and can you hear me? Yep. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on this project. So this is a project on ADAS, let me uh, call it normally, which is the Advanced Driver Assistance System, specifically on transit buses. Uh, so before we go on to the project specific, I just wanted to provide a reasoning on how we came about this particular project. Um, so RTS here in Gainesville is uh, you know, one of the most uh, efficient transit service providers, not only in the state of Florida, but within the, when you compare agencies across the country. And as you can see on the right side, it, you know, just the UF students alone account for over 40,000 transit trips per day uh, in fall and spring semester. Obviously this is you know, pre-COVID situation. So we wanted to see, um, you know, nationally, uh, the number of incidences for, uh, which are related to safety uh, related have been decreasing per revenue miles. Um, and that's the national trend, anyone, RTS is not immune to that. So we wanted to see what systems are there that it can provide to the transit operators that can improve the safety performance. Uh, so Mobile Sheet Plus is one of the systems that we evaluated in this project. Uh, basically consists of uh, four cameras, uh, two in the front and two in the back, mainly to monitor the blind spots um, on the buses. So this system also has a telematics that's installed in each uh, individual buses, and there is a web portal where you can download all the high resolution data associated with uh, every event that occurs uh, from each bus. So over a dozen different alerts are generated uh, and you can download that through the iTuran website um, that are related to pedestrian as well as uh, vehicles. However, our project mainly focused on non-motorists. So we basically focused on two main pedestrian related alerts, which was PDZ and PCW. Now the PDCs were uh, not as critical. However, PCWs were more critical these were the alerts which was triggered if a bus was on a collision trajectory with a pedestrian. And all of these are based on the speed of the bus and the time to collision, and it's a, a dynamic measure. It's not a static measure. So along with those two measures, we saw that other vehicle-related alerts were also correlated uh, to the PDC and PCW alerts. So um, we also looked at it while we were analyzing the data. So there were four main tasks in this project. The first couple of tasks was basically to procure and install uh, the systems on the RTS bus. Uh, the third task was to uh, collect the data. How to, we conducted a longitudinal analysis over a period of one year and analyzed them. And the last uh, task was to survey the drivers and get their perception of the system and then do a cost benefit analysis and we developed a tool to go with it. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just providing a summary of the different tasks. So for the first two tasks, we procured the system and installed on 10 different buses. Um, initially, for the first two months, uh, the system was installed and it was collecting data. However, the alerts uh, were not activated, so the drivers really didn't know um, if any warning was uh, being triggered by the system or not. However, the telematic system recorded those uh, alert so that we used as a stealth mode data. And then in March, uh, we basically activated the system where the drivers were able to see the alerts and then we collected the data for about a year. 
as with any projects, um, you would face challenges with the data set. So we had uh, challenges with an extensive volume. I think we had over 5 million data points. Uh, within those, we had some false alarm. The structures of the data were different. Um, some of the system had issues with the component itself, so there were some data missing, and there were some data inconsistencies between different uh, data files. And then um, RTS also changed routes based on their needs, so not all of the system operated on the same routes. Um, to overcome this, we obviously had to come up with a process to address each of these issues. And um, initially, it was simpler just to clean, compile, and filter the data set. However, the most challenging was the route-based analysis because there was no easier way to filter the data by routes. So we had to basically tag each of the alerts to a specific route and basically develop our own database for uh, the analysis. Um, the data that we analyzed for over a period of one year, uh, we generally found that there was a decreasing trend after the installation of uh, the system. Uh, we coined the term the conflict modification factor, which is similar to the crash modification factor definition. A 65.83%, we basically means that there would be a reduction in conflicts for over 34%. For the route by route based analysis, we analyzed five routes within the UF campus, and we noticed also a conflict modification factor for about 80%, which is a reduction in conflicts for about 20% overall. Uh, for task four, uh, we surveyed the RTS bus drivers. Uh, we had about 18 bus drivers participate in this effort. We broke them down into smaller groups, so we had five different groups, so we could gather more information from each of them. Uh, several different questions were posed specifically related to the safety functions of the systems, what were they experienced, uh, uh, good and not so good part of the system. Overall, most of the drivers brought a feedback that they felt that the system improved safety. They were, the alerts actually helped them in certain scenarios. They were able to recollect certain specific cases where they had uh, not seen a pedestrian, whereas the system alerted them and uh, they found such scenarios very helpful. Uh, they also provided some inputs on how they can improve, how the system could improve. Um, there were uh, several reports of uh, false positives and false negatives, although those were less frequent. Um, lastly, we developed a benefit cost analysis tool. As we know, for to quantify the benefits, we would need the crash data for before as well as after scenario. These systems are relatively new, so we don't have a robust after crash data. Um, now, literature suggests that there is a correlation between conflicts and crashes. Uh, so we reviewed literature and we used the conflict modification factors, the surrogate measure, to quantify the benefits. Um, so in the, uh, similar to the EB analysis, we took the similar approach and developed uh, the benefit cost analysis tool in our Excel spreadsheet format. Here we populated data for all 30 agencies in Florida. So um, most of the agencies we select, it would pre-populate all the associated uh, inputs related to number of crashes, how many revenue miles were, uh, did they operate in the past five years, and all of the other associated data that would be needed. If the user has the data available, they can override and manually input those uh, variables. Um, and what you would see is the life cycle from about five years to about 12 years. So that's what we found that the system would be um, uh, mostly active for. And it would populate uh, plots of the benefit uh, cost ratio as well as the net benefit for the different scenarios that you want to analyze. Um, so where we are currently is we have submitted the final draft report and uh, we are on track to close the project out in the next month or so. So I think that's all I have for this particular project. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you. All right. Uh Thank you so much, Nitin. I think there is a question on the chat box that we can take later. Um, a quick note for the upcoming speakers. We are running like five to six minutes uh, late on time uh, with that uh, to uh, talk about the next project on the data analytics component and the video detection. Uh, we have uh, Tanya Banerjee from the computer science department. Yes, yes, Tanya, we can see your screen. 
uh, you might want to unmute yourself, Tanya. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So good afternoon. I'm Tanya Banerjee and I'm going to present our work as part of the CISC UF team led by Professor Ranka. Our work is supported by uh, FDOT and NSF for smart cities and cyber physical systems. This is our uh, team. Here are our team members. And here are our sponsors and partners uh, from FDOT, FDOT D5, City of Gainesville, National Science Foundation. Now, broadly speaking, our objectives are to apply artificial intelligence to improve safety and operations. That is pedestrian and vehicle safety and improving signal and network operations. Now, we apply artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms on data sets collected from sensors such as loop detectors, radars, videos, and so on, and also from simulation. The platform we developed for ingesting and processing the data it is edge and cloud-based and involves large-scale IoT data management and GPU computing. Some of the algorithms we use to process the data are generative adversarial networks, reinforcement learning, LSTM, and so on. So here are the objectives, a finer version of the objectives for smarter intersections, as well as corridors, networks, and connected and autonomous vehicles. So essentially, we use traffic data with AI algorithms to come up with robust, uh, robust applications. Now here on this slide, the gray cells are the data sources that we use extensively. And we often fuse these data sets to gain deeper insights into the data. And then we develop a host of applications as laid out in the white cells. Now, some of these applications are already developed uh, while uh, some others are still work in progress. Now, in addition to these applications, we also developed an edge and cloud-based system to ingest, process, store, and access this data. Uh, we are also currently developing a user interface so that authenticated users can access this data directly. So for the rest of my presentation, I'll introduce two related applications, the first of which is trajectory analysis. So here we developed a video analysis pipeline that processes traffic videos to generate spatio-temporal road user features. Now, these help us to recognize the type of object in the video. These could be pedestrian, bus, cars, etc., and also locate their coordinates uh, and speeds. The output of the video analysis is a set of trajectories at the intersection. Here are some results of clustering the vehicle trajectories. These are the trajectories that we got. And these are displayed here using our visualization software. The trajectories that belong to the same cluster have the same color. And these are our uh, pedestrian trajectories for, for a different intersection. So clustering the trajectories help us to automatically get to the outliers. Um, upon analyzing the outliers, we found that while some of them are processing errors, the others were real anomalies, and I'm going to show you some of these here. So uh, the panel on the left, that shows some trajectories that happened uh, at a red light. So, so these vehicles jumped a red light, and those on the right, these are spatial anomalies where vehicles changed lanes at the intersection. Now with the trajectories available, our next application is to process these trajectories to detect near misses in an offline manner. Uh, a near miss is said to have happened if two trajectories come very close to each other at the same time 
and there is a sudden deceleration in at least one of the trajectories. Now, this is an offline algorithm that we use, which means that it's not a predictive algorithm that may be used to alert the in involved parties. But we are also working on a predictive near miss detection algorithm. Uh, this effort starts with trajectory prediction. And here are some preliminary results where the green points are being predicted. We also create a heat map for an in intersection for identifying the hazardous areas of an intersection that are more prone to near miss events. And also currently we are working to leverage these ideas to develop and compute safety matrix at each intersection based on a combination of video and loop detector data. That's to summarize, we have access to very rich transportation data sets, which we use to apply uh, AI ML algorithms to make our intersections safer and to improve their operations. We also described a uh, edge cloud-based system to ingest, process, store, and access the data. And we discussed video processing and near miss applications. Thank you so much. Right. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Tanya. So uh, next up is Dr. Justin Mason from the Department of Occupational Therapy. Uh, he is originally from Florida State, so his team lost pretty badly yesterday. I'd request everyone to go easy on him. Justin? What an introduction. Uh, can you see my screen, Prusy? Yep. Okay, great. Let's never talk about that game again. Um, all right, so I'm going to present on our Stride Phase 1 demonstration study. Um, which is going to be utilizing that shuttle that Jesus mentioned earlier today. And all we did was uh, collect users' perceptions, older adults, before, uh, after riding in the shuttle, and then after a simulation. Um, and that would be in the driving simulator. So I'll give you a quick rundown right now. Seems like we're kind of pushing for time, so I will try to be diligent. All right, quick acknowledgement. We should definitely acknowledge Stride. We should also acknowledge TransDev, the city of Gainesville, and Okamic for working with us uh, on this project. Uh, I have an exquisite project team. Uh, Dr. Clausen was the PI on this project, and then we have several other names um, that I will not mention right now. Um, I have a fantastic outline, uh, very original. You've probably never seen anything like this before. I'm going to go through the background, the methods, the results, and then the discussion. So the background, older adults, 65 years and older, uh, make up about 20% of the U.S. population. Um, driving is the preferred mode of transportation and very important for them to be active and participate in their community. Uh, autonomous vehicles may hold health and safety benefits for older adults um, if they accept and adopt this technology. Recent perceptions were measured by survey only, so they kind of uh, will just reach out to people and ask them what they think of AVs, but they may not expose them to this technology. We know that being exposed to this technology may play a major factor. So uh, for this, we use that uh, autonomous shuttle, which is the EZ-10 uh, transit vehicle. So the methods would be uh, visit one, they came in, they completed a bunch of very fun questionnaires that took about an hour. Uh, after that, we scheduled them and randomized them to being either in visit um, or to be uh, either exposed to the simulator or to the shuttle, and then they were crossovered. So whoever received the shuttle received the simulator uh, on their next visit, and then vice versa. Um, and that's uh, and after that, they completed another AV user perception survey, and that's what we use to compare pre, post, and then post again. Um, and then today I'm discussing the interim analysis, which was 69 participants out of our um, powered study, which would be 106 uh, older adults. So we developed and created a survey. Um, not going to have time to get into that right now because we're a little rushed. But I basically looked through the literature and aggregated a bunch of uh, questions or created new items and for the development of the survey. And I used a lot of technology acceptance models. Uh, to inform my survey development. Um, all right, and then getting into the results. Uh, the blue uh, lines indicate uh, the baseline measurement uh, for their perception, and we have them clustered in different factors. So um, authority, perceived usefulness, perceived ease of use, and so on, media, trust. 
Um, their second, potentially their second visit may have been the simulator or it could have been randomized to the shuttle. So the green uh, little um, bars uh, are the simulator and then the orange are the shuttle. Uh, so we can see that there was a difference um, in people's or older drivers perceived usefulness uh, with after riding in the shuttle compared to baseline. We also saw that perceived safety, so they thought that the vehicle uh, was safe or that autonomous vehicles may be safe after riding in both the simulator and after riding in the shuttle. And then over here we have trust. Their trust in automation also increased after being exposed to either one of these technologies compared to baseline. And then we saw that uh, their, they were less concerned about their driving efficacy. Um, which would be their ability to drive, and, and that would be after the shuttle. Um, so they did see that the shuttle may be beneficial. Um, here are those experiences aggregated into baseline, time point one, which could have been the shuttle or the simulator, and then time point two. And this was just our way of looking to see if there was a cumulative effect that occurred. So uh, as you can see, trust was increased uh, regardless of what they were exposed to um, after their first and their second exposure. That's what the little asterisk uh, represents. And then perceived usefulness was also increased uh, compared to baseline at the second uh, exposure. Uh, perceived safety was increased at both time points. And then cost was also um, significant after their second exposure. And then we have these beautiful effect sizes over here. Um, Cohen's D uh, basically is taking into consideration the standard deviation and the mean. Um, and we just saw that trust when comparing post-exposure one to post-exposure two um, had a pretty decent effect size, uh, about a medium, uh, small to medium effect size. So uh, the discussion, this was just an interim analysis. Um, it was 69 participants. Uh, right now we've collected and finished up testing for 100 participants and we have six left to test, which we plan on testing, I believe next week, but maybe the week after. Still waiting on NHTSA, um, story of our lives. Uh, future analysis will include modeling. Um, those are kind of some boring uh, information that you may not need to know. And then we have phase two that's just begun, which will be comparing these results with younger and middle-aged drivers. Um, and both of these, or some of this is already uh, published. So we have this um, published in Frontiers and I have the link so I can share this file if you'd like it. And then the survey development was also um, published into a manuscript. So I will stop my presentation there. Uh, I'll try to be quick for you, Bruce. All right, thank you so much, Justin. I do understand that we are uh, running the out of time. I'll try to keep it very short and I'll do a two minute elevator pitch for the last project here. Uh, can you see my screen again? Okay. All right, I'm just going to assume that you can see my screen. So uh, this is the project that we did uh, with the funding from NSF and uh, Florida DOT. So uh, the main objective was to do two, two things, optimize the trajectories for the connected and autonomous vehicles along with the conventional vehicles and also optimize the signal timing. So we are doing two-way optimization here. So our product out of this project was a software product called Real-Time Intersection Optimizer. As you can see in the screen, there are three different components. First one is the sensor fusion system. What it does is it takes all kinds of sensor information, video, radar, LiDAR, and DSRC, and it fuses it into one reliable stream of data. And then you, and, and that data would be nothing but vehicle arrival information, right? And then that is fed into the intersection uh, uh, control algorithm. So what happens is the algorithm comes up with optimized trajectories and sends it to the vehicles. And it also comes up with optimized signal plans and sends it to the signal. So two different things are getting optimized. So, and then the signal controller implements the optimized signal plans. So that's pretty much it. Three different components, sensor fusion, intersection uh, control and the signal control interface and two different kinds of optimization, the trajectories as well as the signal plans. So that is what we did in this project and, and this is an undergoing, uh, this is the project that is going on even now. So this is how the optimization happens. Let me see if I can play this video. Okay. So this is how the optimized trajectories are, are, are come up. So as you can see, uh, our algorithm is trying to make sure that the vehicle trajectories hit the green, green windows, right? This is what our uh, trajectory optimization algorithm is doing. 
uh, the next one is the the green bubbles that you see are the recommended trajectory that is where the car is supposed to go at each of the next time step whereas the solid line is is the tracking of that information so solid line is the ground reality of what the car is doing and the bubbles are where the car is supposed to go if it for if it wants to follow our optimized trajectory information so that is what is happening so where is and, and uh, how does it help so when we compared our al algorithm with the actuated control we did see a lot of improvements depending on the volume and uh, we we did go in 2016 to a uh, toll uh, facility in Tallahassee and we did demonstrate our, our, our algorithms um, so where is the transition to practice? So we did one round of testing and we learned a lot of things from that testing. We are implementing some of the changes and we plan to do another round of te testing late this year. And hopefully if everything goes uh, right, this should be able, we should be able to implement it at a live intersection in 2021. Uh, one of the other things that I forgot to mention earlier uh, in the presentation is um, people a lot of the times ask, you know, you call yourself as a test bed, where exactly is your test bed? Uh, the answer is, the, the, the roads in and, in and around our campus is our test bed. So we don't really have a closed facility as such. In you know, uh, we do go through our uh, uh, DOT uh, APL requirements and, and we test it in the hotel facility before something gets approved to be used on the road. But, but our test bed is our campus and the city. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these things. All I can tell you is we are considering uh, adding pedestrian and bicyclists. We are already funded by uh, DOT to do another project as an extension to this project. Uh, before I go into the questions, I would like to really thank all of our speakers. I know we had a lot of content kind of compressed into a short one hour format. Uh, so if you have any questions, type it in now and we, are all, we can also follow it up with you later. Um, so please use the link on the chat box to uh, uh, give your opinion about the uh, webinar series and you know how we can improve. I am going to go through the chat box now and go one by one uh, and try to answer those questions. Uh, one of the first questions we had was that, you know, do you record these webinars? Yes, we are recording these webinars uh, and, uh, yeah, and we will uh, share the link with you to watch later. Uh, so we have a question on beacons. Uh, so as I know, beacon provides proper location ID. Uh, in train system, location ID will get by CC in CBTC system. I don't know those acronyms and CC through ATP and ATO. Uh, so that's the question. Uh, Dr. Jain, uh, uh, is that question to you? I'm, I'm not sure who, uh, who that question is intended to. Uh, hi, yeah. Um, I, I put in a, a possible response in the chat window. Um, so the beacons that we are uh, referring to, if, if this question is truly directed at me, the beacons that we are referring to in this project are um, the school zone beacons. And those are um, part of city infrastructure, uh, which, uh, which consists of essentially a, uh, some traffic signage, which tells the, that this is a school zone and a light that flashes when the school zone is active. And active refers to certain designated times when we know that um, there's going to be drop off and pick up. So there'll be heavy pedestrian activity at that time. Um, let me know if this, this helps or this uh, fully answers the question. Okay. All right, so the next question is what fisheye camera system are you using? So I can take that question. So uh, Tanya, if we are not wrong, we are using grid smart bell camera. That's the type of fisheye camera uh, we have installed over here in Gainesville, Florida. That is right. Okay. All right. So next question is again directed at you, Tanya. How does this research relate to projects? Uh, Microsoft was working with the city of Bellevue in uh, the state of Washington. Um, are you aware of that project, Tanya? So no, I'm not aware of that project. I need to look that up and do it and get back. Okay. All right. So regarding the trajectory data analytics, uh, there are also commercial project, uh, commercial products available on near miss identification. So how your uh, work is different? So uh, first of all, like we use the near miss detection application as a stepping stone uh, to do other things. 
So for example, we do a heat map analysis of an intersection. And um, we also, um, we, we are also currently integrating that into our safety matrix and safety analysis of an intersection. So, so it, we use that as a stepping stone. Um, and um, yeah. Uh, this is Lily. If I can just add uh, one one thing here is that uh, this work is part of the um, overall I Street database, and so all of these projects are providing data into one uh, platform. And so, as, as Tanya said, um, this is just part of the work, but then there is um, correlations with other uh, sets of data, including autonomous connected vehicles um, and, uh, and the other projects that were discussed. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lily. Um, we have one more question. Let me take a look. So it's, um, it's got to do with cloud computing. How, is, how did the team currently, uh, is currently handling the cost associated with cloud computing, especially heavy GPU runs? Um, yeah. So, so basically, if I could uh, share my screen briefly. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. That. Uh, one second. Uh, okay. So here. So basically, this is our system. So we get the data from uh, the edge sources, the data sources, uh, onto two places. So this, uh, uh, the GPU servers reside in locally um, in two clusters, one at the city of Gainesville and the other at uh, CISE. So we do the video analytics processing locally. We don't do it on the cloud. And uh, after the trajectories are generated, we then uh, go ahead and store those trajectories to uh, RDS and S3. Primarily, we use S3. That's a pretty cheap storage on AWS. Um, so we store on S3 and we, our user interfaces um, also reside over there and read data directly out of the uh, RDS databases at uh, AWS. And currently our monthly costs are uh, to the order of $1,000 a month. I hope that answers the question. Okay. All right. So... I think we have answered all the questions in the chat box. If you have any more questions, you can write to us later as well. Uh, uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, before we leave, I need to, um, okay, let me share my screen again. Okay, I need, I need to remind you guys about our uh, webinar series under the Stride program. So we have a couple of webinars coming up next month. So you can sign up using uh, the Stride link and uh, you can see on the screen. Um, so, uh, and please do uh, uh, answer the short survey uh, link that we have shared that helps us craft our webinars in a better way. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, in, including this, in the speakers. You know, it, it, it was very hard task to put all that information together in a short time. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much.